Okay, if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3, or your devices, you can tune them into John chapter 3. We're going to go through verses 1 through 21 um, this morning, and <clears throat> today we are calling this Out of the Darkness and Into the Light. <clears throat> So, Lord Jesus, as we open up your word, again, Father, speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. <laughs> I will try and get through this slide because it is a little bit maybe annoying in the background there, but it was fun. Uh, <clears throat> so there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you were doing if you were not him. Now, is that correct? Is he correct? Is Nicodemus accurate in his uh, saying that here, nobody can do um, or perform signs and wonders? <coughs> well, we know that that's not true because we know that the Antichrist the Lord would say, in the book of Revelation in chapter 13, is going to deceive many and will be doing signs and wonders. We're told that many people will see false prophets come and they will do signs and wonders. So just because somebody can do signs and wonders doesn't mean that they are of God. What makes them of God is if they are teaching the truth. And Jesus is going to um, kind of go into that with Nicodemus. So, he came to him <clears throat> at night. Why at night? Well, not 100% sure. His name was Nick. But, <laughs> St. <Saint> Nick. <laughs> but, I would suggest that maybe he was a little bit worried about what the other rulers would have been thinking about him. Mm -hmm. And so secretly he went and met with Jesus. Verse 3, Jesus replied, Verily, or very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So the Jewish leaders taught and believed that if you were of the seed of Abraham, you were a shoe in to heaven. It just, it was a give me. Well, I'm born into this family and therefore <clears throat> that is just the way it is. I know many people, I'm not speaking against anybody in particular, but believe that, hey, if my mom and dad were born Catholic or if they were born Christian, then it just makes me a Christian. Even in this country, well, if you are white and live in America, then you are a Christian. And that's not the case. What does Christian really mean? It means to be Christ-like, like Jesus. I know that there are a lot of Catholics. I know that there are a lot of Christians. I know that there are a lot of Americans, red, yellow, black, and white, that are evil in their heart. What makes you a Christian is when you let go of that sin and you say, Lord, I want you in my life. Jesus is going to sit down with Nicodemus and explain what this means. Because we as Christians use those terms, hey, you must be born again. And people don't know what you're talking about. But what the Lord is really saying is, is that you must be born anew. <clears throat> and so... We will continue on. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. That's a reasonable question. There must have been a 
pretty puzzled look on Nicodemus's face when Jesus was saying these things. But what he's trying to say is you must be born anew. There's got to be a new you. And literally, when we look at the, the meaning of that word anew, it means to be born from above, not here on earth. And Jesus will go into that shortly and kind of explain it a, a little more in depth. We are born into this life, into sin. And the problem with sin is that the wages or the penalty of sin is what? Death. death. It's death. We are born into it. Ten out of ten people die. The statistics have not changed since the beginning of time. Okay? We are going to die. And the Lord would say, that's because sin. When God created this earth, it was beautiful, it was perfect, it was awesome, and then what happened? We sinned. We gave our right to the earth, to this planet, who the Lord had handed to us. He said, go, be fruitful and multiply. He said, hey, I want you to have this. This is all for you. And we signed over the title deed to earth to Satan, and it is now his, until the Lord comes and takes it back. Now, I can't wait till that day, but here, the Lord is going to explain what he means about being um, born anew. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 says that the acts of the flesh are obvious. And of course, you guys know this. You know what the acts of your flesh are like. Paul would write here in Galatians that they are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Witchcraft is the term pharmakia. It's taking drugs, alcohol, that thing that alters your mind. That's really um, what that means. Why do we put the term witchcraft with it? Because when you open up or you let go of your mind, who are you opening it up to? The enemy. The, the, the enemy to come in, Satan to come in, or the demonic to come in and take you over. So idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. Why does he say with the like? Because we could just go on and on and on. We can find all kinds of ways to describe sin. He also would say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. However, If we bounce down to verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, how do we define love? It's defined as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And guess what? There's no law against those things. You can be as nice as you want to be, and God is not going to stop you. But he's saying there is a difference. The acts of the flesh, you and I were born into the flesh, born into sin. Our sinful nature, our desires are sinful. That's what we long to do in a sense. But we need to be changed anew, changed from above. We need to be born of the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, empowered by by the Spirit, so that we can live a life of two rules. The Lord said, I want you to do two things. You can't keep 10. All you did was make it into, you know, 600, 700 more, and you still can't even keep the ones that you came up with. So I'm just going to narrow it down to two. I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your strength, all your soul, all your mind. And then I want you to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Just two things. And how is love defined? As he even said here, 
with joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And there's no law against those things, but we must be born anew. We've got to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. When you and I accept Jesus into our life, the Lord gives us his Holy Spirit, which is wonderful. But we need to live by that Spirit, which means reminding ourselves all the time by opening up the Word, going to church, doing those things that we know are going to help us to remember what it means to be loving. Well, here goes Microsoft again. Let me see if I can get her to redo this here. Do a reset. Okay, now let's get back to where we were. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, we have computers and we have scientists that have studied the wind and studied storms and how they move and we have storm chasers out there that have sensors everywhere so that we can predict when really bad storms are going to happen. But when it comes right down to it, let me explain to you in a scientific way from a kid's perspective what the bottom line is when it comes to the wind. Are you ready? You might want to take this down as a note. Wind is somewhat of a mystery. There you go. Okay? That is the ultimate explanation. We don't understand it. We know what it does. You can see it. You can feel it. You can hear it. You can understand what it's going to do if it's too powerful or if it's gentle because of experience with wind. We have... Um, climatologists who say, hey, this is what's going to be happening come spring or this winter. We have radars that tell us where rain um, is falling. We have satellites that are up there so that we can predict some of what is maybe going to come. But how many times have we experienced, we turn on the news, we watch the weather, and it's something completely different? I love that because it shows again and reminds us once again that God is in control. Not everything that we see or experience on this planet is going to be something that we understand. But with the confusion on Nicodemus' face, the Lord says, hey, you shouldn't be surprised by this. I'm going to tell you now in an earthly way kind of how this works. You can't, Nicodemus, understand how the wind works because it is one of God's mysteries. So too the Spirit. I've seen many a church over the years try and duplicate something that is happening at another church. But how is that even possible to say, well, the Spirit is moving over here and look at what they were doing. So we're going to recreate that here, and we're going to try and see if we can't get the same thing to happen. It doesn't work that way. The Spirit moves because that's where the need was in a particular way. We should never, as a church or as pastor, try and duplicate anything that another church is doing, per se. What we should do is say, Lord, what do you have in store for Happy Camp Christian Fellowship. What do you need us to learn today? Where is it that we need to go? What direction do we need to move in? Lord, teach us, show us. Let us know what we need to do. Let the Lord work and we come and worship. That's our job, is just to worship him and allow him to do the work. 
not try and duplicate something that's happening someplace else. <clears throat> it's going to be different. Well, here, Jesus simply says, you're not going to understand the Spirit <clears throat> just, just as much as you can't understand the wind. <clears throat> However, we do know that Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit does talk to our hearts. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The scripture also says that every man, every woman, every child knows in their heart that there is a God. Everybody knows. You know in your heart of hearts. You know it. The entire world knows it. The difference is you and I have chosen to believe. We desired forgiveness from sin. We wanted to be corrected anew. We want the Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We want to be different than what our flesh wants us to do. And man, when we can do that, when we can allow the Spirit to lead us, boy, what a joy and a privilege it is. <clears throat> How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Are you, or you are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you do not understand these things? Now, I like this because, again, he was a ruler. He was a teacher of the people. And the Lord is saying, you don't understand what the Holy Spirit is about. You don't understand what the word has said to you concerning the Lord. Wow. That's kind of a rough spot to be in if you are a teacher and you don't know what to teach. That's a rough thing oh. if you are a teacher and you found out you're not teaching the right thing. Oh. Yeah. Yikes. But I will say this. Does Jesus condemn him? Oh. No. In fact, he'll say that here in just a minute. I'm not condemning you. I'm just trying to teach you. I'm trying to get you to see what you should have already known. <clears throat> you are Israel's teacher. And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. <clears throat> but still, you people do not accept our testimony. <clears throat> now, this is interesting because when you are called to court to testify, you're not there to testify <clears throat> of what somebody else has experienced or what somebody else has said, you are there to share your testimony. This is what happened. This is what I saw. This is what I know. The Lord would say, hey, look, I'm testifying to what I know to be the truth. You should understand these things. Otherwise, what's the point of all of the show? What's the point of all the miraculous signs and wonders? What's the point of going around um, for a three-year ministry and sharing all this if it's nothing different than what you understand? You don't get it. Nicodemus, you, you got to understand the reason that these things are happening is because it's not what you've been teaching. Why are you here tonight? Why did we come today? Because I want to learn more. Okay, if you want to learn more, then you've got to accept the testimony. You've got to accept what I'm telling you to be the truth. In verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I'm speaking of heavenly things? You see, <clears throat> Nicodemus didn't really say anything that backs up that statement. But Jesus knew his heart at that moment. He knew what was going through his mind at any given point or period in, in that little study that they were having. And Jesus also knew that he wasn't believing. So he said, hey, I want you to get this. So I'm going to open up your mind to understand that I do know what I'm talking about because right now you don't believe. I tried to explain it in earthly terms you didn't get it, and you're not believing. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. So this in light of him sharing testimony. 
who do you think has the best understanding of heaven? Somebody that's been there. Which is why he says here, the son of man. Or in other words, what Nicodemus would have understood to be the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one. Jesus is speaking of himself because that's what he called himself. Jesus is saying, I know heaven. Why? Because that's where I am from. He opens up the truth to Nicodemus and he's basically telling him, Nicodemus, I am the Messiah. I am the one. I am from heaven. I am the chosen one. <clears throat> well, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, this is interesting because Nicodemus would have been thinking, well, wait a minute. Where does it say that in the Old Testament? So Jesus takes him to the Old Testament. And he takes him where? To Moses. And he takes him to the story of them after being taken from Egypt, and as they were wandering out in the wilderness, they began to complain, didn't they? In fact, we'll read that here in Numbers uh, chapter uh, 21. They traveled from Mount Hor <clears throat> along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt? to die in the wilderness. There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Isn't it great when somebody gives you food and you just complain about it? Oh my. Well, verse six, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and they bit the people and many Israelites died. Now, snakes in the scripture generally speak of what? Poisonous. Well, these were poisonous snakes, but not all snakes are poisonous. But almost all the time, almost every time, it speaks of the enemy or Satan. Right. Okay, We know the serpent <laughs> mm -hmm. right in the garden came and deceived. Um, and that is exactly what he's doing here. So now Jesus takes him and kind of gets Nicodemus to, again, rethink this picture. He came out of Egypt. Egypt is a picture of what? The world, okay? And even though they were brought out of the world and into a desert place, they still didn't accept the work that Jesus was doing. Right. <clears throat> they complained about it, yeah. even as you and I do. Lord, what the heck are you doing now? Mm -hmm. Why is this going on in my life? How come I never feel like I'm ever in green pastures? How come this feels like a desert? He's painting this picture for Nicodemus so that he can understand what and who Jesus is. So what happens when these people were bit? <clears throat> well, he goes on in Numbers 21, verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. That's great. You start with confession. Confess your sins. Confession brings healing. <clears throat> well, we sinned. We spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can take a look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole or a cross. And then anyone, uh, anyone that was bitten by a snake um, and looked at the bronze snake lived. Now this is interesting because the snakes that came and bit the people, the poisonous snakes, the enemy, so to speak, they are to now turn to a pole with a snake on it, but it's a bronze snake. So let's kind of talk about metal here so that we can understand the picture because this is not that Satan is being lifted up on a cross. That's not the idea here, okay? So what is gold the metal of? What does gold represent? It's the metal of... Deity. Very good. Deity. It's the metal of God, okay? And silver, silver is the metal of? Ooh. Very good. Redemption. 
Okay? Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is our redemption. Okay? And then bronze is the medal of judgment. Okay? When you think about the articles that were in um, the temple, many of them were made out of uh, bronze and gold and or silver. These medals that point to these specific things that Jesus would do when he would be lifted up on the cross. So <clears throat> he takes them back to this story and then he continues in John um, verses 3, 16, one we know so much. Now thinking about that picture of the serpent, the brass serpent or the bronze serpent, that judgment being placed on a cross. Where was your and my judgment when it comes to our sin? Who do we look to? We look to Jesus. Where do we look to? We look to the cross. When Jesus was lifted up on the cross, <clears throat> David wrote in Psalms 22, verse 6, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. And Jesus was, wasn't he? He was despised to the point where he was placed on the cross, and all of our sin, as Colossians would say, was then nailed to the cross. Judgment took place at the cross, and then Jesus goes from that picture of Moses in the wilderness, those people attacked by um, serpents to something different, Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And then he says here, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The bronze serpent was lifted up if the people turned to that bronze serpent, that picture of judgment hanging on a cross, they would live. Jesus says, I also will be lifted up on a cross and judgment will take place for all of the sins of the world. In fact, he would say at the very beginning of Psalm verse 22, Jesus would speak these words from the cross. Psalm 22 verse 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because all of the sins of the world were placed on Jesus and he became that worm, that snake, that bearer of our judgment. Jesus died one time for how many of sins of the world? All of them. So Jesus paints this Old Testament picture for Nicodemus and says, and now I will be lifted up. Okay? And all you have to do is believe in your hearts. Believe in him and you shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Condemn the world. Jesus did not come to condemn people. He came to bear the burden of sin, to take the judgment that was designed <clears throat> against sin, but because we're sinning, the wages of that is death. It was not the original plan. God didn't want us to do it, but we dove in. <clears throat> and the Lord would say, I'm here to fix it. I'm not going to condemn you, but I'm here to save you through myself or through Christ. Well, <clears throat> moving along in verse 18, he continues to say, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. If you do not, then you are buying back your own sin. <clears throat> Okay? You're saying, Lord, I don't want you to take my sin. I will bear it myself. I'm going to do it myself. I'll make it to heaven. And I'll, I'm just a, I'm a good person. That's not what it says. The scripture says it has nothing to do with you being good. It has to do with him being good. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you in Jesus' name. So, if you do not believe, you're taking on your own sin. In verse 19, this is the verdict. Remember, we're giving testimony, so now comes the verdict. <clears throat> this is what the judge would say. 
This is what the father would say. The light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. How many of you would agree agree that sin is fun? It is. It can be quite fun. But it leads to that pit where we get bitten, we get poisoned, and we start to die. And that's not God's fault. Whose fault is that? It's mine. I'm the one who did it. I need to take responsibility for my own actions, my own sin, my own stuff. But Jesus said there's no, there's no out for you unless it's through me. In fact, he would say, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except by my name, through me. Well, <clears throat> we do tend to love darkness because it is fun. But our evil deeds cause us a big problem. Paul would remind us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. He was raised up on the cross and he became that sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. But everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. It is interesting that Jesus brings this up to Nicodemus who came to him when? At nighttime. And he says, look, why are you coming to me at night? Is it because you're afraid of the daylight? You're afraid of what other people may know? I want you to know that I'm not going to condemn you. I love you. You can be free. You can be free to come and see me anytime. But here's the thing. If you're not willing to step out of the darkness and into the light, then you buy back your sin. You keep it. Well, everyone who does evil hates the light, hates Jesus, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Do you like your sin being exposed? No. Me either. But I'll tell you what. If you uncover the wounds, then the doctor can treat them. And Jesus is our great physician, and he can heal. Heal. Confession comes when we, or healing comes when we confess our sins. And Jesus says that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 21 here, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So if you're going to do this, then you're coming into the light. If you live by the truth, then you come into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. When you are believing, you become a doer. If you believe in the Lord, then you will begin to do things for the Lord. Satan... And the demons believe, don't they? And they shudder because they know what's coming. They know hell is coming. It was designed for them. But the Lord would say, hey, if you buy back your sin, then you're you're, you're, you're playing for the wrong team. You're going (coughs) with them into the darkness. Well, Jesus would simply say here, you need to be a doer. We need to come out of the darkness and into the light. So, when we wrap things up here, was Nicodemus, did Nicodemus get saved? Doesn't say right here, does it? But interestingly, and we'll get there later on down the road, in John chapter 19, John tells us that after Jesus died on the cross, there was a man who came to take Jesus' body from Pilate. Okay? Who was with him? Nicodemus. Nicodemus was with him. When Joseph came to Pilate, he did it in secret. 
I find that fascinating because Nicodemus did, it would seem, all of this in secret. And Jesus said, you need to come into the light. Could it be that Nicodemus, hearing Jesus say, it's not just about believing in your mind and in your heart, but you need to do things for me. You need to follow through. Could it be that he went with Joseph that day, bringing myrrh, 50 pounds of the stuff, and the scripts of cloth to bury Jesus in so that he could spend time talking with Joseph, who was a secret disciple of Jesus, so that he would say, hey, Job, come into the light. Come out of this, this dark place. Why would you bother to go and help if you weren't saved? Yeah. I believe <clears throat> that though it's not clear that Nicodemus was a believer. Jesus said to <clears throat> you and I today, we need to believe and our faith in him needs to come with action. Faith without works is dead. dead, okay? It doesn't mean anything. Even Satan and the demons believe in God. The difference is, what kind of fruit are you showing? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, those things that we read in Galatians chapter 5? Or is it the acts of the flesh? Which are you doing? And I like that we get that little tidbit there in John 19, that Nicodemus came and he helped Joseph bury the body of Jesus Christ. That's amazing to me. So Father, <clears throat> help us come from darkness and into your light. Lord, we know that many have already asked you into their lives. But whether here in this room or those that are listening on Facebook or will go to the teaching later, Father, I pray that they would give their heart to you, that they would understand what Jesus is saying here, that belief in him doesn't come with condemnation. It comes with forgiveness. And Father, I am so thankful that you died on the cross for our sins, that all of the law, all of our sin was nailed to the cross, as you tell us in Colossians. You became sin, who knew no sin. You were perfect. And yet, all of my sin, all of our sin was placed on you. You took the judgment that was meant for us so that we might have eternal life. We thank you so much for that. May we put our faith into action. May we do those things that you have asked us to do. And Father, I thank you that you show us that Nicodemus was doing something for you. Lord, let that be said of each and every one of us. Let us help others come out of the darkness and into the light by sharing what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have an amazing week. Go your way. Pray. Share. Stay in the light. Not in the darkness. Amen? Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.